He's a pastor uh, and a missionary to Indonesia for a number of years. And he is our minister, actually, for this coming up week. He's come down to help us because we have a guy that's ditching us and uh, going to be leaving us without any kind of help or guidance or leadership. And so, brother... <laughs> Last brother. day unshackled. Last Sunday unshackled. <laughs> Seven days. Seven days to go. Yeah. So, Charlie's... Charlie's running out on us, so Brother Hansard's here to cover for me while I escort him out of town. And uh, <laughs> Is that how we put it, Charlie? Hey, listen, this is it. This is your final chance to get your digs and make him want to come back. All right? Uh, <laughs> I've found that the people that treat Charlie the worst are the ones that he seems to like the most. And I noticed. I notice he doesn't really like me very much, and so I think I've been altogether too kind. And so uh, we'll work on it. Anyway, I guess it's your turn. But anyway, I hope you folks get a chance to spend uh, some time with Brother Hansard. But he's going to be—he's going to be our preacher Wednesday night, and then all day next Sunday, and then also he's going to be doing outreach this week. I will be doing outreach tomorrow and Tuesday. And, uh, and then he's going to be going with a couple people Wednesday, but if you'd like to join for that and be part of that, uh, you, you would uh, be delighted to get to know him. He's from, he's from up south, and so he's got that uh, up southern Aww. culture. And we call it up south down here, brother, Aww. because this ain't the south. <laughs> We're south, but the south's up there. So anyway, uh, Charlie, your turn. You come on. You going to get into the church on time? Oh, I always, I always open the chicken door. You know, you don't want to force a man to marry someone, so. but I think he should. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open to Second Timothy chapter one. Second Timothy chapter one. So we just finished up with 1 Timothy, and we'd seen that his main theme there was he's addressing Timothy on addressing the church at Ephesus on how to behave. So that's what we looked at last six weeks, really. And then now we're going to be looking at uh, Paul's second letter to Timothy. Uh, so 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So his introduction. Okay, I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy, uh, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And uh, be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor uh, of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Okay, so we'll stop there. He, uh, actually, go down to verse 13. Verse 13. Uh, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, and then that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. So he's charging him here, again, very similar to how he did in 1 Timothy. Um, if we were to continue reading towards the end, we see that this as well is uh, going to. This is towards the end of Paul's life. Uh, he's going to tell him in chapter four as far as that he's run his. Uh, he's run the race. He's finished the court, and, and that uh, he's kept the faith. Uh, and for Timothy to continue strong, but he's writing to him that he's to hold fast a form of sound words. And his challenge here, primarily, is to him as a minister. But there's some things that we can learn, and that's really what I wanted to look at. Verse. 7, 
Um, well, we'll read verse 6 because that's the immediate context. They said, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Uh, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. It's really what I kind of wanted to focus on for this morning. Now, this is written specifically to Timothy so that he would stir up the gift. Now, in context, it seems that the gift would be. Uh, I don't believe necessarily his spiritual gift, but rather the, his gifting as far as being a, a minister of the gospel. Um, he's going to refer to that as well later on, and then also he addresses some of that in 1 Timothy. And it seemed that Timothy had a bit of either shyness or maybe even a measure of cowardice to him, uh, that he, for whatever reason, he was not uh, seeking to exercise as he should. And then he addresses him, now, mind you, the spirit of uh, power, love, and of a sound mind isn't exclusive to Timothy, but rather that is just a general uh, truth with regard to God's gifting us as believers. And so I want to look at having uh, the, the, uh, the gifting, basically, that God's given us of power, love, and of a sound mind. Okay, so power, the gifting of power. Now, the word's doing must, but it, the idea behind it is that it's ability. Uh, we all have natural giftings and abilities, but God gives supernatural ability, supernatural enabling. God gives supernatural power. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 addresses the issue of spiritual gifts uh, when he was, when this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And then in, um, well, we'll start at verse 1. It says, Now concerning the spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Okay, you know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols, uh, even as you were led. Wherefore I give, unto, I give you to understand that no man speaketh uh, by the Spirit of God, calling Jesus accursed, and that no man can say uh, Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Okay, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are diversities or differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And then there are diversities of operations, uh, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. Uh, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to elaborate more here. But at the point that you're born again, you receive, yes, eternal life. There's actually a number of things uh, that happen at the moment of salvation. Uh, I mean, obviously, you're sealed. Uh, you have a home in heaven that's waiting for you. Uh, you receive the Holy Ghost, and you're sealed until the day of redemption. Uh, and, as well, is that you're gifted by God in some measure. You have at least one spiritual gift that you're given by God's Spirit that if when you yield to him uh, and you'll exercise that and it's told here in first corinthians that so that it would profit uh with all so in other words it's not for your benefit but it's for the benefit of others really it's for the benefit of the church uh, so as you seek to walk in the spirit as you seek to exercise the spiritual gift or gifts that god has given you then the church is going to be benefited the church is going to grow and that's god's intent um, the abuse in 1 Corinthians, uh, at the Corinthian church, was that they uh, really were seeking attention. They were being divisive, uh, and they were doing things out of flesh dependence or fleshly manner rather than depending on the Holy Spirit of God. And so um, Paul addresses them in that manner. And so they weren't wrong about spiritual gifts, but what they were wrong about in that you know, it's really for the benefit of others rather than for self-edification. Uh, God's intent with the spiritual gift is that you would be used by Him to grow the church, to benefit the brethren. Okay, back to Second Timothy. So God's given enabling, God's given power, God's given ability. Um, in other words, you, it is possible for you to be able to have a can-do spirit. I know some people are very, like, melancholy, depressed or uh, very negative in their outlook uh, but and they would say oh well I'm a realist 
you know. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, I'm not really pessimistic. I'm, I'm just a realist. Uh, to some degree, I mean, you could understand if somebody's been hurt, they don't want to be taken advantage of, uh, they don't want to be hurt again, and those kinds of things. Uh, but we're we're called to go ahead and put, you know, to step out, step forth uh, on faith and to trust God. You know, God's able to go ahead and heal us. Uh, and the fact is, is that God's given us the ability, He's got He's given us power. That would include a can do spirit. Uh, he's given us also uh, of love. He's not given us a spirit of fear, which is cowardice there, but of love, power, and of love. Okay, and this would be supernatural. Love. This would be God's love. We're called to love the brethren, and we're called to love our enemies as ourselves. We're supposed to. Um, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one toward another. Um, that's supposed to characterize the life of every believer. Uh, if you're going to be walking in a pleasing manner to the Lord, you're going to be walking closely to the Lord. Uh, there is a point where we are to contend for the faith, and we are. Uh, and the fact is, there, like Pastor says, when contending for the faith, you're going to come off as being contentious. Um, but your motivating factor uh, should be uh, the love of Christ, the love of Christ constraining us. God loves sinners, and so we're trying to reach them uh, before it's too late. Uh, and as well, that um, the effects of this world of sin in our life, uh, as distasteful as it is, uh, we should hate sin. Uh, we should hate, uh, you know, devil's devices. But the fact is, we should not allow that to affect our mindset and our mentality and our attitude that we're, we're cynical uh, and, and harmful to others. Uh, we're supposed to be as harmless as doves. I mean, wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. And then as well, he tells us here of a sound mind. He's given us not a spirit of fear, but of a sound mind. In other words, you have a healthy mind. You are clear-headed. You're clear thinking. Go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and then reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, uh, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Okay, nevertheless, where Whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. And then, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now uh, tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, uh, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, uh, who mind earthly things. Okay, for our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'd say, well, wouldn't Philippians 4 be more appropriate? It actually is pretty good. Uh, Philippians 4, where we're told to, uh, in verse 8, as far as the whatsoever things are true, uh, honest, just, uh, pure, uh, lovely, and then a good report that we're supposed to think on those things. But our mentality... Um, should be of one that is pursuing uh, eternal things. Now, verse 14, uh, pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, I didn't read the whole context there, but he, what's the high calling? What's that high calling that he's speaking of? I know we didn't read it, but 
if we're familiar with it, what, what's that high calling? Yes. Don't you see Christ? No. Uh, Christ likeness. I'll just give it away. All right. The high calling of God in Christ Jesus is, is Christ likeness. In other words, I'm called to be like Christ. That's what I'm striving for. That's what I have my eyes set on. Okay, so uh, as I mature in Christ, I should have that as my primary focus. In other words, I'm set my affections on things above. Not on things of this earth, and then uh, the thing that I just aggressively pursue after is development of my inner man, and that is a lifelong pursuit. All right, and that's why he says that uh, I haven't already attained, but I follow after. Uh, and then for those of us that are already, he saw he's, he uses the word perfect. Now, perfect doesn't mean like okay, you don't have any. Uh, improvement that we had, but rather it's mature. You know, you're complete. You you are where you should be. So if you're a mature Christian, maturing Christian, then that should be your mentality, your mindset. In other words, I aggressively pursue Christ likeness. Uh, I don't act as if I've already arrived. It's a lifelong pursuit, and so I continually seek to grow in my development, in my spiritual uh, character. And here's the reason why he gives as well, is that verse 18. Uh, there's many that walk contrary to that. Uh, and he calls them even enemies of the cross of Christ. And here's a description of them, verse 19, uh, whose God is their belly. So the fleshly appetites is what you know they look to. That's what they control controls them. Uh, whose glory is in their shame. So the things that they would be proud about, that they would look at and they would promote as something glorious, if you will, are actually shameful things. So, according to God's perspective, that which is shameful, they value, they put high esteem on, and they look at it and they say, wow, this is glorious. And, in summary, who mind earthly things? So, an earthly-minded person is going to be somebody that is glorying in shameful things. earthly-minded person is going to be someone who's uh, could be controlled and uh, ruled by fleshly appetites. Earthly minded person is someone whose end is destruction. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to hell. That's just simply a believer is going to have a wasted life. They're going to stand before God, saved yet so as by fire, wood, hay, stubble, burning up and consuming what they would have produced with their life rather than having gold, silver, precious stones that would, uh, you know, endure through the fire and have rewards. So we've been given, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for those coming in, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Are we going to go back there, 2 Timothy 1? So God's given us a uh, spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, a healthy mind. A uh, healthy mind characterized by that which is, uh, in other words, you're focused on the eternal. You're not going to be covered about uh with sin doesn't mean that you don't have uh, sin to deal with, but rather you're going to be seeking, as a maturing Christian, to be focusing on uh, the eternal rather than the temporal. You're going to be seeking to uh, develop your character uh, to be more Christ-like. Uh, you're going to be seeking to live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You're going to be seeking uh, to win souls for Christ. You're going to be seeking uh, to have a, a life that would be characterized by uh, something that you, God would be able to say, well done, that good and faithful servant, so that we wouldn't have to stand as shame before him. And so God's given this, and this is for every believer. In other words, it isn't just specifically, he's addressing Timothy, but this is a fact that he's given this to all believers. In other words, it isn't just exclusive to individuals that we would look at and hold in high esteem as far as, um, you could say, church leadership, uh, uh, any, any sort of Christian hero that we would look at and see, like, wow, you know, this person's been greatly used of God. But the fact is, this is every believer that has this. Every believer is able to go ahead and be used of God greatly. Every believer is able to be uh, somebody uh, that can have an impact in this world for eternity and have God be well pleased with them and be able to stand before Christ to hear well done. Uh, it's not exclusive to just a certain segment 
of society or a certain segment of, uh, I guess, Christians, you could say. But it's, it's, it's God, that's God's desire, God's design for everybody uh, to be used. Then go to chapter 2. Chapter 2. And he transitions. He actually warns him toward, well, you know what, we'll go back to verse 13. Verse 13, chapter 1, I'm sorry. Verse 13, chapter 1. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And then that good thing which uh, was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. And then this thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me of whom are uh, by jealous and hermogenes. Uh, Lord, give mercy unto the house of the Mysophorus, for he often refreshed me, and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently, and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me in Ephesus, uh, thou knowest very well. And then he transitions, verse 1 of chapter 2, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, uh, who shall be able to teach others also. And this is another of the commands that he is entrusting him with here, and that is that seek out faithful individuals to be able to communicate God's truth. And the intent with that is that those individuals would in turn seek out other faithful individuals to go ahead and commit God's truth and that's continually until Christ returns or you know he dies but that would that would continually go on and so for us here today no we're not Timothy and you can say oh well that was specifically directed towards Timothy but that's the pattern that God had set uh, and he through Paul to Timothy showing us uh, through Holy Spirit of God recording this for our benefit, we can see that we should as well seek to do the same. Uh, one, we should seek to be faithful ourselves, uh, and then two, also be faithful to that which was entrusted into us. Uh, we have a great grand privilege um, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he tells them that their ambassadors, they have been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation and then they also have uh, the word of reconciliation so they have the ministry of reconciliation the word of reconciliation um, the message of reconciliation uh, which is Christ Jesus uh, came in the world to save sinners uh, he didn't just stay dead by the way but he rose again from the dead and he can give new life and so we need to seek to be faithful to that which was entrusted uh, to us we uh, if we are not, uh, you know, reality, God help us. We, um, you know, we stand, <laughs> stand to have great loss, and then stand, uh, stand before ashamed, uh, stand before Christ ashamed. But God's pattern, God's plan here: seek out faithful men uh, to teach, so that they in turn would continue that and propagate. Um, the truth that's been given. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Starting at verse 11, this is kind of jumping in the middle of a context. This is Paul, well, excuse me, <laughs> we don't know this Paul, but uh, writer of the Hebrews writing to Jewish believers that are under persecution. And he's addressing them concerning Melchizedek. Um, and then, so verse 11 is of chapter 5 of the Hebrews. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Uh, for 
when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, uh, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. Uh, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And then verse 1 of chapter 6, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, uh, let us go on to perfection. Again, the idea of perfection there is not like never sinning again, but rather on to maturity. And so he addresses the same type of mentality here uh, as far as what Paul is telling Timothy. Um, now he's addressing it from a negative aspect here, and that is that the writer is writing to believers. Um, we haven't covered this, but for those of you familiar with the book of Hebrews, who was he writing to? Who was the audience? I already mentioned it, but who was the audience? Jewish believers. Any other, like, was it just the preachers only? Jews. Believers. Jewish Christians. Yeah, just, 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 just believers. In other words, yeah, just the believers. So everybody was across the board. And he's trying to communicate truth to them uh, concerning Melchizedek, but he says, uh, you are dull of hearing. You are dull of hearing. And then he gives them the reason why. He says, for when, uh, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, okay, ye have need one teach you again. All right, for when for the time you ought to be teachers. By the amount of time that you guys have already received truth, have been instructed in truth, you should be able to communicate truth to people effectively. In other words, God's expectation of the believers is that you be able to communicate truth. He wants you to be a teacher of truth to others. Um, you might not have a Sunday school class, but the fact is you ought to be well acquainted enough with the Word of God. That's God's design that you could uh, be called upon to go ahead and uh, teach a Sunday school class and you don't have to be, <laughs> or, or I guess pastor doesn't have to be afraid of the fact, oh man, what's he going to teach? Can he handle it? Uh, in other words, you had to have uh, maturity and uh, well acquaintance with truth, uh, with the Spirit of God, to be able to go ahead and come up and teach somebody that really doesn't know much. Or maybe they've been taught wrong, to be able to go ahead and take them from where they are to where they need to be. That's God's expectation of all believers. That's not just exclusive to what we would consider as uh, church leadership uh, or to uh, the pastor. In fact, is everybody. Uh, from God's perspective, is supposed to be someone that carries truth and communicates it to others. That's God's design for your life. God wants to use you for that. And uh, with these believers, he's chiding them because they weren't in a position to, even though they could have been uh, for the time that they had been saved, that for the time that they've been exposed to truth, for the time that they've uh, been taught, for the time that other people have put into their life as far as investment in training them up, uh, but they weren't to that point. And it was because, it says here, um, well, verse 14, it says, Strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even to those that by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, when they received instruction, they didn't really do anything with it. Uh, they took it in, so they have a repository of knowledge, but they didn't exercise it in their life. In other words, they didn't allow God to use the circumstances and the situations and even what he has communicated uh, through his word, through his Holy Spirit, through uh, God-given instructors and leadership in their life to for, for them to, to allow God to work, really, in their life with regard to that. So they take an attitude of, you know, I mean, we should all be desirous of learning things, you know, but it isn't just strictly uh, in a classroom environment. And the fact is we need to have an attitude that says, God, I need to learn. I need, you know, everybody comes to a point of maturity, obviously, where they're communicating to others. But you never really stop growing. You never really stop learning. Or you should 
at least. Uh, the fact is, there's a there's a lot to learn. Even um, older gentlemen that are um, well experienced and well seasoned, um, they would tell you, you know, that I still have a lot to learn as far as in the Lord. And you would look at wow, you know, these guys have been greatly used uh, and such, and they would they have they have an attitude that says I still need to learn. Uh, not as if I have already attained the same mentality as Paul that he communicates, but I follow after. Uh, and so, if we are to be well pleasing, if we're going to be doing justice to the uh, not only command but to the responsibility that we've been given, then I need to uh, well be opposite of this example. This is from the negative, but rather I should, as with Paul, I strive after. Uh, I follow after. Now, as I seek to grow, I need to be allowing God to exercise me. I need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in my heart and life and not just simply take in information, but put it to use. Allow um, circumstances and situations that come up in my life rather than frown at them, get a negative attitude. Uh, that's I know that's human nature, but we can't deal with it, as with James when he tells us that we're supposed to counter all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. And he gives us some things that we know, knowing that trying our faith worketh patience. Uh, Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 5. Um, and so these things God allows for our maturing and our maturity uh, go to um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 2. If we're going to be someone that's going to be faithful and we're going to be standing before Christ unashamed, uh, we're going to have gold, silver, precious stone as opposed to wood, hay, stubble. We need to have this disposition or this attitude. And so he tells him such when he tells him, uh, Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and in the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. Commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now, mind you, you say, well, that's impossible. That's difficult. That's, uh, how can I do that? We've been given the spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Uh, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Um, you might have natural ability that you've been given, but the fact is, it's a supernatural undertaking, and I need God's help. I need God's enabling, mm -hmm. and so I need to seek the grace of God in my life <coughs> and fulfill his commands so that I can stand before him unashamed and I can be faithful to his commands. Uh, the Holy Spirit, um, a lot of times we tend to think of, okay, well, yeah, he's in the book, and we maybe knee-jerk because of abuses uh, or just crazy things that uh, people that are unknowing uh, tend to do. Uh, we look at the charismatic church and then everybody's running wild and uh, wow, you know, so we'll knee jerk away from either wanting to have Holy Spirit interaction in our life. But the fact is God, the Holy Spirit lives within us and he gives a divine enabling and the fact is we should have active uh, relationship with him in our life. Uh, He's to give me understanding. He's to give me guidance. Um, go to John chapter 14. Verse 23, John chapter 14, verse 23. Okay. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, uh, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Okay. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Okay. These things have I spoken unto you, uh, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send 
in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance uh, whatsoever I have said unto you. And then peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as, uh, not as the world giveth, uh, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither uh, let it be afraid. So, among other things as far as the Holy Spirit's ministry in our life uh, is to bring to remembrance. Uh, and then he shall teach you all things. And we tend to shy away a lot of times. And it's understandable. I mean, uh, you, if, a lot of, I think a lot of those things are either just manufactured in flesh or even just maybe of demonic origin uh, as far as the abuses that we see in charismatic churches. Uh, I mean, so that's understandable. Why do you want to shy away from that? But the fact is, a lot of times as a knee-jerk as well, we want to exclude the Holy Spirit from our life. But he's supposed to be active. Uh, we're not to grieve him, we're not to quench him, and uh, he can, you know, he's very capable, obviously, of enabling us, and then uh, we're supposed to seek guidance. He guides us, he brings us to remembrance all things. Uh, he teaches us. And so he's not, he's not to be feared. I mean, we fear God, but he's not to be, in other words, like, shunned in our life. Go back to Second Timothy again. Second Timothy chapter two. Verse 3, okay, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Okay, no man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And he gives an example here. If a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must uh, be first partaker of the fruits, and then consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. There's difficulty, hardship, and I don't say this to like down the Christian life because the Christian life is actually great. It's wonderful, uh, but there's going to be an element of uh, opposition that we're going to face. Um, and we need to have a spirit about us that says, "I'm not quitting, regardless of what comes down." Um, the writer of Hebrews addresses that to the believers that he was writing to. Uh, and he tells them there that they're to look unto Jesus. Uh, that's how they keep from quitting. Um, in other words, consider him who endured such contradiction and sinners, lest you be weird in your minds and faint. Um, their issue was they were turning back, <coughs> that it's not worth it to live for God. And he says, well, here's the reasons why it is worth it to live for God. You just need to exercise faith and patience. And so, as well, uh, we should learn and we should exercise that same uh, faith and patience, and we need to have that same diligence and no quit attitude. Uh, the fact is, uh, go to chapter three. We'll start at verse ten. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of all of them, uh, but out of out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Uh, and that's not a pleasant thing <laughs> to have to think about or actually even have to consider. But the fact is, uh, if we're going to live for God, there's going to be opposition that we're going to face. There's hardness to be endured. Uh, there's difficulty. Uh, Peter actually writes to believers and he tells them that thereunto we have been called to suffer for his name's sake. And so, uh, again, that's not to say the Christian life is bad, but there is, a, there is an element of opposition 
and negativity that we are going to experience. But in spite and through that, you can still be joyful, and you can still be well-pleasing, you can still fulfill the will of God in your life, you can still have God's grace available to you, you can still be blessed, and you can still go out faithful to the Lord. And we're, that's what we're called to do. Um, and so these mentalities, this mindset, these things that Paul addresses Timothy concerning, now you say, okay, it's addressed specifically to Timothy, but yeah, all scriptures can by inspiration of God, and it's written for our admonition. Uh, it's written for our benefit so that we can learn. We need to remind ourselves, we need to remember the fact that we've been given the spirit of power, okay, ability of love, of a sound mind. Okay, I don't have to allow trials or difficulties and hardships to get me screwed up in my thinking. Uh, and as well is that <coughs> I am been committed truth and I am responsible to be able to communicate that truth. I need to be faithful to it and I need to be faithful to communicate it to others who are faithful that in turn would hopefully be faithful to propagate it. And as well I need to be someone that endures hardship uh, living for God. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. And Second Timothy one seven is a good life verse. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. Questions? No. All right. I guess um, next week will be Brother Hansford and we're dismissed. Mm -hmm.